Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is David. I'm an alcoholic. And I uh, want to thank the committee and, and for inviting Susan and I to celebrate and to share with your, uh, your conference. I guess this is the 12th year. And uh, congratulations on that. Um, I find that that uh, you know I hope I never I hope I never get it in my mind that somehow I have a right to anything that goes on around here. That because I got sober that that somehow I, I deserve what happens here. Uh, I've been taught in Alcoholics Anonymous that you know it's a privilege to be able to participate, and so I appreciate the fact that you've allowed my wife and I to participate in your conference and uh, up here in God's country. So. <laughs> I want to thank Cindy and, and Dan for picking us up at the uh, airport. My wife and I, we've been kind of on the run, so we've just, you know, we've been up early and to bed late the last several days, and they picked us up, and they took us to dinner, and I swear, they must have thought they picked up a, a wet one, because I'm like in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was not the a lively art of conversation going on in that van. It was like in between cat naps, huh? Oh, Good job, Dan. Uh, (laughs) I do want to say, though, but thank you very much. That's, you know, shows a lot. You drive two hours to pick some speakers up, and you drive two hours back, and, and, uh, you know, you spend a good part of your day doing that, so we really appreciate it, and thanks for the the lovely hospitality. Um, Both, good job, good kickoff. Uh, You know, I'll tell you, when I've been... When I have participated in this program, right from the beginning, I got introduced to a brand of Alcoholics Anonymous that also shared the time and space with members of Al-Anon. And I just don't know how not to do that. You know, we got sick together, and I'll tell my story in a little bit, and I'll tell you there's an opportunity to, when we get well together. There's a power in the room when and when we can share recovery. So I'm glad to be a part of a, a conference that, that seems to have that theme. So uh excellent talk bo um you know i grew up in the uh, i grew up in the city of chicago so i'm a northerner and i just currently reside in oklahoma um my father was uh my father was a professional ball player he played for uh, in the minor league system for the chicago cubs and and he blew his arm out and and but athletics was always a part of my upbringing and, you know, I've heard a lot of speakers from behind AA podiums talk about the fact that, you know, from an early age, they felt like they were, they stuck out, that they were different. And my two older, I've got two older brothers. I'm the youngest of three kids. And, and my two older brothers are fairly good athletes. The middle brother is the best. He was, a, he lettered in football, basketball, and baseball in high school. I hated him. Um, <laughs> and really from the, an early age, I'm one of those dumpy fat kids. And, uh, you know, so I feel different. You know, I remember as a young kid, my father would take us out running. I don't know, I don't know if a worse torture than take a fat kid running. <laughs> but right from an early age, we got taught fundamentals. So, you know, we were taught how to throw a baseball, how to throw a football, how to shoot a basketball. Um, you know, and, and again, I, I know how to do all those things. I'm, a, I'm an incredible athlete you know, stuck in a body that's just unwilling to cooperate. (laughs) I don't run very fast. Little League, I've got on record some of the longest singles in Little League history. You know, leaving home plate, my, you know, I've got it in a vision in my head, I'm going to get to third, but by the time I get to first, I say, the heck with that, I'm just going to stay here. I don't run fast. I don't jump high. Gravity challenged. Um, my freshman year in, in high school, I went out for the football team because that's what you do. You go out for football. And um, right away, I found out that uh, I had a problem with my back. I've got a big yellow streak right down the middle of it. I don't like getting hit. Uh, the coach kind of frowns when the guy with the ball runs by and you step aside. You know? <laughs> I remember the uh, 
I remember it was about the last week of football my freshman year, and, and the, the school I went to in Chicago, we had, uh, we had four freshman football teams, the A squad, the B squad, the C squad, and the D squad. I rode the bench on the C squad. He looked at me. He goes, you know, Bray, for a guy that comes to football practice every day, you're without a doubt the worst football player I've ever seen in my life. And, and I, I was. I, st- I stunk. So the net, it, w- I was out of my freshman year. I went to the tennis team. Great serve. But if anybody returned it, point over. <laughs> so cover, covering the court, fat guy on the tennis court, that don't make too much sense. Um, Found the game of golf. Bingo. What a great sport for a guy like me. One of the things I found out early about the game of golf is when you hit it, you don't have to run after it. <laughs> found out later that things like, you know, you, once you get away from the clubhouse and the coaches, you can hit it, light up a cigarette, and walk after it. Now you hit it, and you get in a little motorized vehicle, and you go after it. So, But from an early age, I became fairly good at the game of golf, and at about the same time, I don't know, I was 14, 15, I took my first drink. Now, I don't know, I don't know that I'm an alcoholic when I take my first drink. I don't know if you're born alcoholic. I don't know if you drink yourself into alcoholics. Our book says we can't answer the riddle. Why do I have this reaction to alcohol? But I can recall from the earliest age when I took a drink of alcohol, Something happens. See, my whole life I've been under this cloud of I don't match up. I don't meet the expectations. I don't, I don't have the, the athletic ability my brother does. I don't seem to have what it takes. But I took that drink of alcohol, and it seemed like all that fear went away. I took that drink of alcohol, and it seemed like I fit in. And I liked that feeling. I didn't like what it did to me. I'm a puker. I didn't like the end result, but man, I like that, I like that euphoria that alcohol seemed to give me, and right from the beginning, I knew that I needed to drink as much of this stuff as I get my hands on. I don't know, you just have an intuitive thought. This is good. This stuff is good. I like it. I don't mind, you know, it's like if, if, if if I had a reaction like I had to alcohol with other stuff, you know, if I ate a bunch of apples. And about 30 minutes later, I'm vomiting. I'd say, you know what? I'm not going to eat too many more apples. I take, I drink alcohol, and all that other stuff happens. And it's like, I don't care. It's worth it, baby. This is some good stuff. So I start drinking. I'm playing golf. By the time I'm, I don't know, by the time I'm a sophomore in high school, I'm down to a one handicap, but I'm also drinking. I've got some opportunity in this, in this thing, but I've also got this idea that I like it over here, too. So I start right away, start playing both sides of the fence. And you can't do that if you're an alcoholic. I don't know if I'm an alcoholic when I'm 16. I just know I drink whenever I can drink it. I start stealing so I can drink. Because when you're 16, you can't walk into the liquor store and and say, give me a bottle of Jack Daniels. We would would go into a store, groups of three or four, and two or three would do a diversion. Get the attention of the clerk. The other guys over here getting the stuff. So I'm a thief. I don't, I'm already lying about it and stealing, and I'm not that far in, because I have to have this stuff, and I don't even know. You know, when I read Bill's story, it talks about the progression. It talks about, you know, it started off here, and then it got a little serious, and then there were some consequences, and then it got worse, and gradually it gets bad, and then bam, it's down to here. And I took that, I took that path fairly quickly. I don't know that I'm suffering from phenomenon of craving. When people, you know, that would have been nice information to have. You know, when, when the parents are looking at you with disgust, saying, Dave, why do you do that? Well, I, man, I just had phenomenon of craving, Dad, just really. <laughs> but I didn't hear those words until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I know something's wrong. If somebody would have asked me, are you an alcoholic, I would have said no. Because I don't know what it is. You know, in our 12 and 12, some nice information it says, under the lash of alcoholism, we're driven to AA. And it says, and there we learn the fatal nature of our situation. 
I don't know, you know, people say I, I was an alcoholic three years before I got, I don't think I knew. I know something's wrong, but I don't know what's going on. I just know I need to drink. I graduate high school and I go out to, I go through this um, community college and I join the golf team and I'm at, I'm at both two things. I'm at the height of my golf career and I'm just starting to bloom as, man, alcoholic, alcohol has taken a very important part of my life. The team that I was on, we won a, we won a state championship. And we got some recognition. Some guys on the team got some recognition, and they flew us down to Odessa, Texas, to play in the national golf tournament. And there were some scouts there for some of the big schools. And the first two days, I don't drink. And in these golf tournaments, when there's colleges involved, you can either qualify as a team if your team plays well, but if your team doesn't play well, you can qualify as an individual. Well, the team, other team members didn't play very well, but me and one other guy, we qualified as individuals. So now the now there's a shot. But I took a drink the night of the second round. Tea time, third round. Tea times are early. That's not a good thing. I missed the bus to get to the golf course. So I hail, a, I hail, a, I'm hitchhiking with my golf clubs, hung over. I'm running to the first tee trying to put my shoe on, and I get there one minute. I haven't had a time to warm up, so suffice. I didn't play very well in the third round. So I just went and got hammered the night of the third round, and the shot vanished. I never, I never saw another opportunity in the game of golf after that. It was more important for me to drink. And I thought, I'll just go have one. I did not say that night of the third, between the second round and the third round. I did not say to myself, you know, Dave, I think you should go get drunk and ruin your opportunity. All I said was, you know, I just want to go have one. I'm just going to go relax. But see, I don't know I have this. I don't know. I didn't know I had this reaction to alcohol. And if you're, if you're new out there and you're wondering, are you or are you not an alcoholic? I'm grateful that our book is very clear. If you're, if you're not sure. You know, it doesn't say go to a lot of meetings. What it says is go drink. We're one of the few groups in my area that says to the new person, if you're not sure, go drink. We find that very helpful. If you're not sure you're an alcoholic, don't sit in an AA meeting and bad about it and be mad about it. I don't know of a single thing that could be worse than being new and sitting in the place that you're pissed at because they have the courage to tell you the truth about your situation. Our book says I'm going to have to surrender before I can do something over here. And I had to drink myself into that surrender. So I graduate from this junior college. I tried to make, I went, so I, now I go to Northern Illinois University up in DeKalb. And, you know, DeKalb's, DeKalb's a cornfield with some college buildings in it, basically. <laughs> I tried to go out for the golf team, and I didn't make it because I'm drinking. So my golf career is over, and now I'm a full-time drinker. I didn't get a job, and at this point, I'm drinking like I want to drink. You know, there's a line in our book that talks about we don't have the ability to control and enjoy our drinking. I can do one or the other. I cannot do both at the same time. I cannot control my drinking and enjoy it. I can control it at times, but I'm not enjoying it. I'm, I'm thinking why I'm doing some control drinking. I can't wait till I can get someplace and bust out. Now, if I'm enjoying my drinking, there is no control about it. I'm drinking like I drink. I've never seen a cap that I've ever put back on a bottle. Once it's off, it's off. There is nothing better in life than about half or third of the way down a good bottle of Jack Daniels. And I don't understand that. I graduated from that junior college, so now I'm, a, I'm labeled as a junior in college. And so I, I enroll in Northern Illinois as a junior, and I go to the guy that has all the plaques on the wall that says, let's try to figure out what you can be. And I thought, I'm going to be a leader in the business world. You know, Bill talks about he imagined himself at the head of vast enterprise. I love that line. It doesn't say he was in, he just imagined. I, you know, I'm always imagining things. But by this time in my life, I have continually failed to meet low expectations that I'm setting for myself. 
So I go to this guy, and he says, well, we, you really don't have the great point to get into our business school, but you could do this. And he's, he lists all these things that I'm capable of doing, and, and it's like welding. And, and, you know, I'm not, if you're a welder, great, but I wasn't shooting for that. So I took some freshman art classes and some other stuff that had nothing to do with anything so I could drink. And I spent the next four months just one just being drunk, basically. On a college campus, one of the best one of the best days of the year is Halloween. Now the guys I was hanging out, we celebrated Halloween for about two weeks that year. And the night of Halloween we decided to go to this one particular party, and we all dressed up. In 1980, there was a movie that came out. It was called The Warriors. It was a movie about gangs, and one of the gangs in this movie was called the Baseball Furies, and they painted their face red and white and wore baseball uniforms and, and got baseball bats and made a fool out of themselves. So these guys that I'm hanging out with, we decided to go to the party as the Baseball Furies. By this time in my life, one of three things happens when I take a drink of alcohol. And this is it. I, I start drinking, and I either I run out, I pass out, or I black out. And that's it. That's all I have. You know, our book is very clear. It says at some point in the alcoholic, in some point of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control once he begins to take a drink. And our book uses that phrase, drinking career, three times. Did you know that we're the only people that have drinking careers? <laughs> nobody even thinks about it they just drink and go home we have drinking careers <laughs> I'm thinking about issuing you know like those baseball cards I'm thinking about you know getting a card you know flyer or fleer or whatever top top shelf you know and you got a picture maybe you got a before and after picture of yourself and you turn it over and you got your stats you know <laughs> Nineteen seventy eight, go to jail, lose job. <laughs> seventy nine, beat wife, you know. So I lose control every time I drink now. At this point I have lost the ability to control my drinking. I cannot guarantee to you what I'll do when I start to drink. I cannot tell you where I'll end up with. Where I'll end up. I cannot tell you who I will be doing what with. but it doesn't matter because I need to drink. So we go to this party, and, and about what I was told, we go to this party, and what was told to me is about 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm, uh, some of the people that I live with see me walking across DeKalb in a direction that isn't in the direction of where I live. Let me back up a step. I'm skipping an important part of this. Part of the baseball furies is holding that baseball bat. Well, I don't have a baseball bat. But in my closet, it's about a four-foot, one of those four-foot wide closets got that old four-foot closet pole. So I take all my clothes, two T-shirts, and, and I grab my four-foot closet pole, and I go to the party. And this is one of the nights where I black out. Now, what was told to me is these people see me walking across town about 3 o'clock in the morning and in the direction. So they grab me, and they bring me home, and I walk into my apartment, and I've got about this much of that closet pole left going, ooh, I was hurting people, I was hurting people. Now, I'm, I know that I'm prone to violence. I lose most of the time, but I'm prone to violence. I got a big mouth. Alcohol and a big mouth don't mix. This is one of the times in my drinking career that you've got my attention. I'm starting to look in the newspaper. School, school, papers, school papers usually have a little section that they list all the, the crime that goes on on the campus. So I'm looking in there to see if there's any listing about some jackass with a red and white face and a baseball uniform and a closet pole knocking on people. But I can't find anything. I'm looking in the local papers. I can't find anything. So I do what I do with that what I've done with every other horrendous act that I've ever committed. I just push it aside. You're st if you're stupid enough to be around me when I'm drinking, you deserve what you get. That's how I think. And so I push that aside. One morning, it's late November. I come to in our apartment. You know, book says we don't we don't like. It says we don't like to pronounce anybody else alcoholic. It's not that we don't. We just don't like to do it. We're, 
We're willing. I don't know if I'm living with alcoholics, but I can tell you one thing. Our apartment looks alcoholic. You walk into our apartment on this in this place, and it's one of those places where if you walk into the kitchen, there's no, there's no cup, plate, dish in the cupboard, cabinet, or drawer. They're all on the counter, covered with some degree of old food, or they're submerged in that sink with the water that has the orange stuff floating on it. Our carpet kind of has that squishy, glazed-over, alcoholic crunch because it's covered in that stuff. We have three paper products, and they're all interchangeable depending upon the quantity that you might have. Coffee filters, paper towel, and toilet paper, and if you ain't got one, you use another. And if you're out of all three, you're up, you're on your own. <laughs> so one morning in late November, I come to and my face is in the carpet. And I have an intuitive thought, I've got an art test. Now, I don't know why the heck I would be thinking that I've got an art test. But I think I got it. So I wake up, I look out the window, the sun's shining. So I put on my uniform of the day, which is my T-shirt that I've cut the sleeves off of. This is the only time in my life that I've actually because I've lost so much weight that I would dress like this. But So I cut a T-shirt off, the arms off the T-shirt, proudly proclaim across my chest, it says, free me. And on the back of my T-shirt, it has a big fist in the air with one, one digit extended. And I'll tell you, if there's a flag that I lived my life under, it was the back of that T-shirt. You don't like what I'm doing? You don't like what's going on? That's my attitude. Up yours. Just leave me alone. So I go into this, I go to take this test, I walk to class, I put on my shorts and my, and my flip-flops, and I grab my number two pencil because I got a test. I get, to, I get to the place where they're having the test. It's one of those auditorium-style seating where they put all the dummy freshmen in. You know, and you got to look up and you got to find your seat. And it's a room about this size with this many people in it. And I look up to try to find a place to sit. And I notice something really quite different compared for all of you as compared to me. Every one of you is in heavy winter clothing. <laughs> I'm not talking about like windbreakers. I'm talking heavy stuff. I'm talking about the big, you know, back then they had the big, you know, cowboy, that cowhide coat, big hats, masked eyes where you only see eyes and gloves and scarves. And I walk up the aisle in my shorts and my T-shirt with the sleeves cut off and my flip-flops and my number two pencil. And I'm walking to find a seat and I hear somebody whisper, what does that guy know that we don't? <laughs> See, because when I came to that morning and looked out the window, the sun was shining. Now, my brain isn't firing. My, I've, I've, I've killed a lot of brain cells. And so what, what's firing, a lot of them, they, the synapses ain't connecting or something because it, there's a lot of not information not connecting. I look out the window and the sun's shining, and the only thing that really comes to my mind is sun, warm, <laughs> free me. The walk home was extremely cold. <laughs> it's late November up here. It's cold. I get home for the Christmas break, and by this time, my relationship with my parents is strained. They're trying to support a, a bum. I've stolen from them. I've lied to them. You know, my sponsor helped me when I finally got to A, and I'll, be, I'll get there here soon. But my sponsor told me, he said, you know, one time, Dave, that, you know, we talk about I'm a thief. He said, you know, the worst type of thief is the person that steals another human being's right to be happy. See, and I've done that to so many people. I've, I've ripped the hearts out of these people. 
they're watching their son just destroy himself. So it's in between Christmas and, and New Year's, and my parents get invited to a company outing for my father's business, and, and so they're gone, and by this time my two older brothers are out of the house, so it's just me in the house, and so I make a phone call to one or two friends. And it's one of those times where you call one or two people and about 98 show up. And I get drunk again. And this is one of the nights that I pass out. And I'm just over there in a, in a, in a pile. And my, my parents' home is laid waste. In my parents' bedroom, up in their closet, is their lockbox with all the family deeds and stuff. Two days later, my mom found that lockbox beaten to with an inch of its life, jammed behind the furnace in the basement. Now, you cannot lie your way out of that. How, how did it get here? There is no explanation for that. Their home is destroyed. Their stuff is stolen. Their furniture is broken. And this isn't the first time, the tenth time, the hundredth time. If I don't ever get past one thing, I hope I never forget this day. I hope I never forget how my father looked at me with hatred. There wasn't disappointment. My father looked at his son with the hatred that a father should never have to look at his son with. The last thing my father said to me before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous was, he looked me in the eye and he said, you know, Dave, with a son like you, I don't need any enemies. You disgust me. You make me sick. A couple of days earlier, my mother said, you know, we'd really appreciate it if you didn't tell people you were part of our family. Now, I never took a drink and said, you know what, I, I want to drink myself to that place. I want to drink myself to a place where the parents that brought me into this world despise the ground that I walk on. But I deserve everything that, I, that I'm getting at this point. I'd like to say that, I, uh, you know, drinking took me there. You know, I took me there. I don't know of a better definition of unmanageability than this. I know what I'm doing is wrong and I can't stop. I want to do something different, but I can't stop. Our book, in the doctor's opinion, which has the greatest information about the mindset of an alcoholic, when I'm not drinking, see, our step one doesn't say, admit you're an alcoholic. It says I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless over alcohol whether I'm drinking it or not drinking it. When I'm not drinking it, our book says, I become irritable, restless, and discontented. Now, those were big words for me when I got to AA, because my vocabulary at this point isn't very strong. I use phrases, most of the words I use are four letters or long phrases that begin with mother. <laughs> and so, irritable, restless, and discontent, I don't know what they mean. All I know is I'm pissed most of the time. And when I'm not drinking, my vision becomes narrow. And I don't have the ability to fight off the idea of drink's going to make it feel better. I'm irritable, restless, and discontent unless I can again experience the ease and comfort, which comes immediately by taking a few drinks. Drinks that I see these other cats take with impunity. I take a drink and I destroy the lives of people around me. I take a drink and I'm beating people with closet poles. I take a drink and I'm a liar and a thief. I take drinks and I'm and I'm I'm a I'm a destroyer of people. I use you and lie to you and steal from you and and take. And that's what I've become. And I don't want to be that and I can't stop it. I have no more power to stop then than the, than the man in the moon. And I'm looking at this man and he's looking at me and I cannot stand what I've become. And for whatever reason, on that day, the second day of January in 1981, well, it wasn't that day, it was the day before, but bottom line is, he said, you know, we can't have you live here. You can't stay anymore. The next, I don't know, hour later, they said, if you want help, we'll take you to a treatment center. And some words came out of my mouth, 
on that day that I had never said before. Because if you're raised like I was raised, you're raised to meet your problems head on, be a man. I wish that Manuel would have come with those words. How do you do that? Be a man. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Mine keep breaking. I say, if I'm going to stop drinking, I'm going to need help. That's it. That's all I said. But those words have never crossed my lips prior to that day, ever. They whooshed me off to a treatment center. Treatment center has nothing to do with my recovery. 28 days in a guarded place. I just refused to swim in their pool, and all I did was stay mad for 28 days. At the end of 28 days, they handed me my $10,000 big book. <laughs> we suggest you go to AA. They had a little, they had another step in this process, so they whooshed me off to a halfway house. I've yet to figure out, this is 25 years later, I've yet to figure out what it's halfway to or from. <laughs> it's the dumbest idea if you really think about it. If you stop to think about what they're doing in these places, they put 15 or 20 or 30 new people all together in one place. Do you know what new people talk about? Crime. <laughs> <laughs> we have no principles. We're all together. So now I'm hanging out with other brand new goofy people. And I bond to one of these cats. And so we sit in the back row of AA meetings that they make us go to, making fun of people that are sober and living good. And about three months sober, this guy gets drunk. This is the only friend in the world I have. And he gets drunk. <coughs> and so I decide to go over and try to save him. Bad idea. I went by myself. I walk into his apartment, and he's, he's stretched out into that recliner. It's one of those... A, a single or you know single guy apartments. It's got a recliner and a TV, and that's it. And he's and he's drunk, and he's got all his bottle and the beers around him. And he goes, "I said, do you want to go to a meeting?" He said, "No. Do you want a beer?" <laughs> Unhappy in recovery, here's a guy offering me a beer. I don't know if I would. I think if I would have taken that beer, I would. You'd need a new speaker here tonight. I said, no, i tell you what, if you ever want to get sober, call me. I'm still waiting. But I went, at that moment, I walked out of his apartment and I knew something. I knew that AA didn't work. That's what I knew when I walked out. AA, you guys have been lying to me. It's my buddy. So I went that night to my last meeting to, to resign from AA. I didn't know that you just stopped going. <laughs> Nineteen eighty one, it's still when they had they didn't have styrofoam yet, they still had those porcelain cups, so coffee was made in porcelain cups and, and they were they were green, but the inside of every porcelain cup was brown. And and I sat in that meeting that night thinking about my exit speech. Getting madder and madder as I sat there. And the guy that was leading the meeting tried to avoid calling on me, but he, there was too much time and too few people, so he had to call on me. And for about the next five minutes, I said things in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that should never have been allowed to have been said. I can't repeat most of the words that I used, but this was pretty much the theme. All of you people have lied to me. AA is a joke. You're nothing but a bunch of mindless sheep. My buddy's drunk. You guys, this, this thing doesn't work? Oh, yeah, and by the way, I want all my money back. <laughs> like I've been putting money in your basket. <laughs> Finally, the guy that was leading the meeting after about four or five minutes of this profanity-laced bombshell that I laid in your meeting... The guy led in the meeting said something very important to me. He said, Dave, shut the hell up. We're tired of listening to you. He said, number, he goes, I'm going to say a couple things to you because this is probably going to be the last AA meeting we see you at. And I want you to hear this before you go. He said, Dave, the reason that your buddy's drunk tonight isn't because AA doesn't work. 
He said, the reason that your buddy's drunk tonight is simply because your buddy tried, not, he hasn't used the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. He chose not to work it. Now that's the first point, and it's not the, it's not the one that I really want to tell you. The one that I really want to tell you, Dave, is this. He said, I want you to look around in the meeting tonight. All the people that are sitting here, he said, what we really have is about, we have two types of alcoholics sitting here tonight. There's two types of people sitting in our meeting right here tonight, Dave, and I want you to look at everybody before you go, because this will be the last time you see them. He said, we've got some good examples of Alcoholics Anonymous sitting here, and we have some bad examples of Alcoholics Anonymous sitting here. Now pick the one that you want to be and shut up. Now I got my first resentment at Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. I didn't know there were good examples of AA and bad examples of AA. I thought we were just all getting along as like Rodney King. Can't we all just get along and just smoke cigarettes and drink coffee and tiptoe through the AA roses out there? I didn't know that there were some people doing some work in Alcoholics Anonymous and there were some people not doing work in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know that because I'm only hanging out with people that aren't doing anything. You can't see what goes on in AA when you get here two minutes before the meeting starts and leave the minute it ends. So now I understand there's some good examples and bad examples. But I don't know how to be a good example. I know how to be a bad example. I'm a very good, I'm a very good example of a bad example. I did everything wrong in that first stretch except get drunk. Now, I'm not changing. You can't change if you don't change. I know that's deep. <laughs> Dr. Silkworth saw it, and he doesn't even, not even an alcoholic. He said that these guys, these alcoholic type people, they seem to go over this spree over and over and over. What a wonderful word. I, I, I've just got caught up in some of the words Bill uses, and, and Silkworth uses the word spree to describe what we do. Spree. It sounds so lovely. Let's have, let's have a spree. Man, I'll tell you the way I drink. I don't go on sprees unless they're like murdering spree. I have rampaging, violent, Whatever, it's a bad deal. <laughs> and I come too out of that stuff, and them are looking at you. And if you haven't had them look at you, you don't know what I'm talking about. Something's got to change. It says, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Now that word scared me, psychic change. What is that? Kind of sounds spooky. Am I going to, am I going to call Miss Cleo? What the heck is a psychic change? <laughs> my sponsor helped me with that. Real simple. He just says, my sponsor puts things in very simple terms for guys like me. I had to go from being a taker to being a giver. That's what I got to do. I got to go from taking and I've taken, I've been a taker my whole life and I got to learn how to be a giver. And I have to learn how to do that for fun and for free and for nothing to in return, just for the sake of giving. And I can't do that without your help. I today need your help more than I've ever needed it. I haven't had a drink in a lot of days. But I'm as goofy as I can be. And I'll tell you a little bit about that here in a minute. But I need this psychic change. Well, our 12 steps do that. In fact, the first part of our 12 step guarantees it. Having had a spiritual awakening, which is in essence the psychic change. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Well, I'm going to need somebody to guide me through the steps. I need somebody that has worked them, that knows what to do in a case like mine, so that I can follow somebody that's already got there. My sponsor said something that's just, he uses deep, just deep language. He goes, you can no more tell somebody to do something you ain't done than you can come back from a place you ain't been. <laughs> I need somebody who's been there so that they can stand on the road and say, come ahead, it's this way. Oh, 
Now you get every, every so often in your sobriety, you come to a fork in the road. And you've got to make a decision. Go this way or go that way. Go to meetings or get a her. Sponsor standing right there at the fork going, I suggest you come here. And you're looking down there. Well, I think I'm going to go down here, sponsor. I wouldn't go down there if I were you. Why not? Because there's an 800-pound gorilla down at the end of that road. You're going to go down there. And if you go down there, you are going to get you the no, you know what whacked out of you. I wouldn't go down there if I were you. Oh, Sponge, you're just making this to bitch. It's God's will. God's will. So I go down there. What do I meet? 800-pound gorilla. Get the whack, whack. Come back to the fork in the road. I hadn't drank, thank God. Sponsor's standing there going, I'm with you, Jim. I'll never do that again. You're right. I'll follow you to the end of the earth, Jim. Woo! Till the next fork. <laughs> but it's real important as a sponsor, if I don't have the experience, when I say don't go down that road, why not? Because there's an 800-pound gorilla down there. If you lie into the people you sponsor and you say there's an 800-pound gorilla and they get down there and there's about a 12-pound chimpanzee, they'll never trust you again. My sponsor knows the road. He's been on it longer than me. He's been down it before. He knows what's there. He knows the things that are going to trap a guy like me. All I have to do is be willing to follow. So I start following this guy. I fall into a group in my second year that's an active group. It's it's sponsorship and it's direction and it's discipline and it's structure and it's AA and it's carry the message and it's sponsor other people. You know, one of the things that my sponsor taught me was, Dave, if you can find anywhere in our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, from the beginning of the preface to the end of Dr. Bob's story, any place, one time where it mentions in that book, be good to yourself. If you can find one place in that book where it says, be good to you, I want you to bring it to me, and I'll eat it right in front of you. On the other hand, Dave, find out where it says being selfish and self-centered and self-seeking and self-deluded and full of fear. My, my sponsor, selfishness, self-centeredness, self-seeking, self-pity, that's one of my favorites. I wish I could fill a pool. I can fill a pool of self-pity and drown in it. And my sponsor adds a sixth one, self-serving. So I've got all this. I've got like a six-pack of self. And I just, I, I beat myself up with it. And the only chance I have is learn how to take different action. My sponsor started introducing me to actions that are corrective that I'm thinking of you versus thinking of me. I spent my whole life thinking about me, and I never got anywhere than, other than a drunken bum. I go into Alcoholics Anonymous, and my sponsor starts teaching me about, why don't you make, take a commitment in your home group? Why don't you make a commitment to start calling other people on that phone list a couple times a day? Why don't you start doing this stuff? He got me through the inventory. I wrote out all my fears and my resentments and my sex conduct and all that stuff. Now, I've got a beat-up relationship with my parents, and they introduced me to the, the amends step, so I started making amends. And little by little, I start making that stuff go away. But I'm an alcoholic. I'm four years sober. I'm about to do something that I didn't think I could ever do. I'm, gonna, I'm about to graduate from the University of Oklahoma. But self took over. I'm tired. I'm in my senior year. I'm taking two classes that are basically the same. Brilliant idea. You know, the book says, suddenly the thought I had an idea to drink. I have suddenly the thought, make it easier. I take the work from one class and I take it into another class. That's called cheating. I get caught. I'm sitting in front of the dean and he's about to expel me from the University of Oklahoma. My parents are making tr plans to come down to, to watch their son graduate. And I have to call them and say, you can't come. Because I just got caught from academic misconduct. I'm four years sober. That was pleasant. 
Everything I've done up to that point that tried to win back the trust of my parents was destroyed at that point. You ain't changed. Nothing's changed. You ain't drinking. That's it. You ain't changed. You're still a liar. Talk to my sponsor. We go back to work. Well, what are we going to do? Are we going to sit here and whine about it? Are we going to get back to work? Go back to work? Get busy in Alcoholics Anonymous. We can't worry about what your parents are doing. So we're going to continue to do things. When you go home, don't steal anything from them. When you go home, do extra stuff. Mow their lawn. Do the stuff. So I started doing that over again. On my 15th year AA birthday, my, my wife got sneaky and she flew my parents in. 15 years. And they got to see Alcoholics Anonymous at its finest. And they saw... Men dressed up in suit coats and ties and, and with proper language. And they saw the ladies of Alcoholics Anonymous and the men and women of Al-Anon. And they were all saying nice things about their son. And I took my parents back to the airport after that weekend. And my mom hugged me and kissed me and told me she loved me. And my father pulled me aside. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Dave... At one time, I thought maybe you had a promising golf career. But he said, after this weekend, it's, it's very evident that you've been called to a higher order. Fifteen years later. It took 15 years for me to repair the damage, both drunk and sober. But I had to trust my sponsor. And from that point to this point, for the last 10 years, every time I talked to my father... And I've talked to my mom, but especially with my father, because that man hated the very person that I had become. Now our phone calls end with, Dad, I love you. And my father says, Dave, I love you. Son, I love you. Keep up the good work. See, I'm a liar and a thief and a cheat. And I don't deserve, I didn't have, I don't deserve having that relationship back. It's you that gave that back to me. We were on AA campus in this group in Norman, and, and my, Susan was living in one house, and I was living in another house, and she had her two boys, and I was living with a bunch of alcoholic guys, and there was another house full of AA and Al-Anon women, and the clubhouse was at the end of this street, and there was just AA activity going all about, and we would, we'd play cards, and we'd just, just have fun in, in AA and recovery. And Susan went to an Al-Anon conference, and she came back and invited me over for dinner, and uh, we were in the kitchen, and I turned around, she turned around, and I kissed her. And she kissed me back, and that hadn't happened to me in quite a while. <laughs> now, I, I'm still, this is about four years sober, so this is the time when I'm still making decisions, like she. So she kissed me back, so I made the very best decision I could come up with. I moved in. <laughs> she had cable. One night we were laying in bed and she asked me a question. She asked me, Dave, what are you thinking? I said what I was thinking. It was a, a, when I said it, it tasted bad. <laughs> tried to get it back, tried to get it back in, but it was out there. What came out of my mouth was, I don't think I can marry you. Wrong answer. We have some nice departing gifts for you as you leave. <laughs> Out I go. I don't know, the next night that was like the Saturday night meeting, or a week later we're at the Saturday night meeting, and she sees me, and she's killing me with her eyes, shooting laser beams, and she comes up to me. She had learned a joke. She's from Texas. She goes, what's the difference between a Yankee and a bucket of crap? She used the bad word. The bucket. <laughs> so I did what I could come up with. I married her. We got married on August the 3rd, 1985, and last, last August we celebrated 20 years of marriage. I'm a liar and a thief and a cheat, and I don't know how to be married. 
I don't know how to do it. But I got, we got a sponsor, we got these programs, and we had good examples of people that were married in this program, and they taught us about what it, what it would take to be in a relationship. And we're part of a conference in Oklahoma. It's called the Canyon Conference, and some of the people that are here have been down to our Canyon Conference, and it's a nice setting. It's an outdoor conference, and, and uh, on the grounds of where we have this conference, there's a little chapel, and every year, my wife and I go into that chapel, and we've been doing this since we've been there. And we go in on Sunday morning after the conference is over, and we get down on our knees, and we do the third step prayer in our marriage. And we offer our marriage up to God and, and have him do with our marriage as he would. And we get up and we stand in the little aisle of this little chapel and we take our rings off and we restate our vows every year and, and, we, and we try to make a commitment to this deal. Because I don't know how to do it other than you've, you, we, we have one primary idea and that's somehow God put two crazy people together. And she'll tell her story and you'll know that it's a bad deal. <laughs> Without you and without these steps and these principles and without God, we don't got a prayer. One time I asked, I told her, because my dad's kind of an angry guy, and, and uh, I told her one time, I said, you know, without Alcoholics Anonymous, you'd be married to my father. And she said, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> One of the hardest things I've ever had to do through this program is, is watch my mom dying from the disease of alcoholism. And it was, it was horrendous. The only time Susan and I would fight is when we'd have to go visit my parents. My mom just started just deteriorating, and, and it was just unbelievable to watch. And, and you know, she'd cirrhosis of the liver and, and blackouts, and she can't remember. And, and it's just killing me. I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should be able to save her, and I can't do a thing. And I'd call my sponsor and say, Jim, I just I can't take it. And he would tell me the story of his father, and his father got sober when he was 78 years old, and he died with just shy of 10 years and his dad would always talk about these were the best 10 years of our life. And Jim would tell me all the time, he'd say, Dave, we don't know what God's got in store, but we'll just keep praying. In the meantime, you just keep doing what you can do. And in 1993, my father lost his job through a series of events, and, and so he's home now most of the time. And one night he gets up, and my mom's not in the bed, and he walks around the house, and he finds her in the kitchen chugging down a bottle of vodka. And he calls me, and, and he says, what do we do? And we talked a little bit, and and the next day he called and he said that he had put mom in a treatment center. And, and that was in January of 1993. And in January, on January 8th in 1994, I stood up in a meeting in Sarasota, Florida, and I got to hand my mom her one-year sober medallion. And on January 8th in 1998, I got to stand up in a meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous and I got to hand my mom her five-year sober medallion. And in... 2003, my mom and dad came to the group in Tulsa, and I got to stand up in my home group, and I got to hand my mom her 10-year sober medallion. And my father went to the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he said, thank you for, for the lives of my son and my wife back. Now, in my area, I'm kind of known as the guy who takes AA seriously, and I do. I try not to take me too seriously. I take AA very seriously. And if you don't, that's your deal. But I pray to God that if your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad or your son or your daughter or your granddaughter or your grandson, your aunt, your uncle needs Alcoholics Anonymous, I hope you're not in the meeting they come to. This is life and death here. Now, we have a lot of fun, and we have a good time being sober, and we have a we have some recovery, and it's fun to be around, but at the core, what Bill says is there's a deadly earnestness to what goes on here, and I hope you don't get in the way of an alcoholic who's trying to be sober. I know today there's as much bad information that's being said in meetings of AA as there is good. You might hear stuff like, you don't need to work that step, you can skip it. Here, don't, read, don't work the steps out of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. We have some guide from some other jackass. Why don't you try this guide? It worked for me. I happen to believe that that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is divinely inspired. And in 25 years, I've never seen a single case of any alcoholic that I've sponsored, that I've worked with in these last 25 years, that have worked the steps out of that book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never seen a single problem come through our doors that that book doesn't have the answer for. I'm a real alcoholic. I'm the alcoholic the book describes. And that book seems to be 
directed toward a certain type of alcoholic. It talks about a certain type, a hopeless case of alcoholism. And that's who I am. And the group that I belong to, we take Alcoholics Anonymous serious. And I can tell you there's no group in Tulsa that has more fun in recovery than our group. But we also take it seriously. You walk into our group, and in our, in our meetings, the men sit on one side of the room, and the women sit on the other. Nobody gets up in the meeting to get coffee while the meeting's going on. Nobody's talking while the other people are sharing. Except once. We'll correct them. What we do is we talk about sponsorship. You will get tired of going to our meetings because all we seem to do is talk about sponsorship, work the steps, and try to help others. The one fact that seems to be of paramount, experience, of paramount importance to me is, is when Bill Wilson got sober in December of 1934, AA didn't start until he got able to par- carry the message to Bob. Bob got sober on June 10, 1935. AA didn't start when Bill got sober. AA got started. AA's birth date is when the first alcoholic carried the message and the second alcoholic got sober. Seems to me that our book talks about that I get well when I start trying to help you. I've never found a passage in that book that says, be good to you, but I can tell you there are countless passages, help others, be of service to others, helpfulness to others. We've got a whole chapter working with others. There's a chapter that says into action. It doesn't say into thinking or how do I feel. (laughs) Lastly, and we'll close, sorry that I've gone so long, the thing that is going on right now in my life is two years ago, I lost a job. That's all I did, just lost a job. People lose jobs. I had been working for this company for 18 years and in my brain, thought I might just keep working for them, and they had a different idea. Previous, and you better be careful what you pray for. Previously, about two months, I was kind of one of my morning meditations, and I said a prayer, and I said, you know, because I dealing with a little pride issue. And I said, God, help keep me small. Bam. Okay. You're... <laughs> if I could just rewind the tape, I think I would have omitted that prayer. But <laughs> Okay, so now you don't have this job. Took a job. That didn't work out. Took us another job. That really didn't work out. So we, we, we've gone on this journey and we took a big risk and we started our own company and and it's struggling and we're not making I'm not making any money and it's struggling and and I'm not making any money and and it's struggling and I'm not making any money and it, it, the tape is just playing and right along with it is I'm I'm filling the pool up self pity self pity I'm driving my wife crazy I just I've never I I can look at myself outside Dave that just stop it just stop it and the only thing that's got me through this place to this place is I sponsor a bunch of these guys in Alcoholics Anonymous and they call. I don't know what would happen if these guys that I sponsored didn't call. And when they call, I talk to them and I find out how they're doing. I don't ever talk to them about what's going on. How are you doing? What are you doing? What's your actions? But through this process, the thing that's happened is my wife and I have got closer. We are, we are, we have doubled our efforts. Bo talked about it. We have doubled our efforts in terms of our prayer and meditation and just the idea of God's going to get us through this. I was trying to convince my sponsor on just how bad I got it. And he just, again, he just says, he says real simple things. We were sitting at, I have this book study where about a hundred guys, some of the cats from up here came down and, and uh, we were sitting in, Every Saturday night or Friday night at this book study, I always do my inventory every year with my sponsor. And so I walk in, I'm reading this stuff and all this self-pity and telling him about how bad it is, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you know, Dave, you're talking about all this stuff. And he goes, what I'd really like, if you could just tell me, if there's, just tell me one thing that you've missed. If you can just tell me one thing that, that you've missed because of it, I might start feeling sorry for you. Huh. Grateful my job's my wife's working. She's got a good job. <laughs> but we haven't missed a thing. And the thing that I know more than anything is is that I sponsor these guys and I hear myself telling these guys <laughs> I hear myself telling these guys what they should be doing. But the minute I hang up the phone it's like I never said that. It doesn't apply to me. 
what's, what has finally transpired is this, is I know that right now in God's world on Friday night, Here in Minnesota at the Sunlight of the Spirit Conference, right now, tonight, all of us together, we're just okay. Everything is fine. We've eaten some good food out there. Going to have pie, ice cream later. You know, things are okay. We're sober. You know, the one thing that I know today more than, more than a shadow of a doubt is, see, I, I should not be sober. I'm an alcoholic. But for some reason, the grace of God has entered my life because of of this unbelievable power that seems to be in these rooms. Most alcoholics will never experience what you and I have experienced here this evening. Most alcoholics are just going to die. You know, you think about the numbers. They who study us. <laughs> if they have come up with the correct number, they say one out of ten people are alcoholic. You know, just if we just center on the United States, that's 30 million Alcoholics in the United States, 30 million drunks just tonight, just running out there. They're just out there. Now, the book, the, they say about 2 million, about half of that's in the United States, are sober. So one out of 30 alcoholics are sober. Those 29 are going to die. They're going to die lonely, cold, back alley deaths. They're going to die in car wrecks. They're going to die in those things that, that, that happen to alcoholics. And the unfortunate thing is, is all the lives that they're going to affect. And yet you and I tonight, we're sitting here and we're happy and we're, we're clothed. That's an amazing thing. We're... <laughs> Look out there and see all those white eyeballs. Amazing deal. I heard a guy say one time, he said, you know, now that you've, you know, now that you've ruined your reputation for the remainder of your life by associating with us, Stay. <laughs> people here in AA understand I can't imagine going to my boss trying to tell him I had phenomenon of craving last night <laughs> I thank God for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous it's because of this program and your steps and the sponsor that loves me enough to tell me the truth about me. And he's had the experience to direct me down our path. Because of that, today I have a relationship with the God of my understanding. And for that, I will always be grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.